Hi, everybody. So I think we are um, we're competing against nice climate, <laughs> which is a beautiful day. So I'm going to get started, and um, and then we can uh, go enjoy the sun. Um, so today's talk is the politics of climate legislation, failed attempts, and the prospect of future legislation with Phil Barnett, who is Princeton class of 79 and parent of uh, class of 213. And um, so we're always very happy when alumni can come back and, and talk to us and show us what, what can happen once you leave Princeton's campus. Um, and today's talk is part of our, the Wilson School's Energy and Environment Thematic Lecture Series. Um, so I just want to give a very brief background on what um, Phil Barnett has done and then we can hear the talk. Um, he's had a long and distinguished career in public service. Again, for the MPAs in the room, that's always gratifying to see that, in fact, you can leave here, go into public service, and stay in public service. Um, his work has contributed to the enactment of major uh, environmental leg legislation, including the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments and the 1996 Food Quality Protection Act. He's led congressional oversight into the tobacco industry, steroid use in baseball, just to show that it, you know there's multifacets to your career, um, pharmaceutical pricing, food and drug safety, contract abuses in Iraq, um, and the deep water horizon oil spill. And he's held numerous other positions in government, which are probably too numerous to list, but are in our press release on our website if you'd like to know more about him. But I'm not going to take any more time. I'd like to just introduce the talk and to remind you that we have a reception after this. It's actually in Schultz Dining Room upstairs. Um, so please feel free to join us up there. Thanks. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. It's an honor to be here. Can everybody hear me OK? Um, I went to Princeton. I had a great education um, here. My son graduated, my daughter is here, and my youngest is actually going to be coming here next year. So I have a lot of ties, and I know the education keeps getting better, uh, uh, better and better. I am the um, Democratic Staff Director for the Energy and Commerce uh, Committee. We're the committee in the House that has jurisdiction over health policy, over telecommunications policy, consumer protection, and what's relevant for this talk our energy and uh, a lot of our environmental policy, including our, our clean air policy. My boss is Henry Waxman, who's one of the, um, he's the senior Democrat. He's one of the strongest uh, environmentalists that's in the House. I went back before this to look, I'm trying to remember when we put in, uh, he put in his first bill to deal with climate change and global warming, and it was April 2nd. Um, 1992, so it was almost 20 years ago uh, today uh, to, this, um, to, this, to this very week. And he's been trying in various ways um, since then to enact climate uh, policies, including most notably last Congress when there was the uh, American Clean Energy and Security Act, uh, also called the Waxman-Markey Act, which passed the House but uh, got stopped in the, in the uh, Senate. Um, he's had a long track record of working on things for a long period of time. When we did the hearing with the tobacco executives in 94, it took 15 years till 2009 to pass legislation giving FDA jurisdiction over tobacco. Uh, the health reform bill was his entire career advances in Medicaid. The Clean Air Act took a decade. Um, uh, climate has been slow in coming and making any major progress. Uh, it, Maybe a surprise, though, uh, I think one of the messages I want to say is that uh, we see a very viable path to have a major uh, climate uh, legislation enacted within a year. Um, that's not something that many people are talking about or see as a, as a, um, as a, as a live option. Uh, but we think it over the coming months, it'll become, a path will become more and more um, visible, at least we hope. The reason is not because Congress is going to care about uh, climate change and protecting the environment. The mood is not there to do that. But the reason is because of the fiscal uh, crises that our country faces. There's a, at the end of this year, the Bush tax cuts are going to expire. There will be a sequester on the defense and discretionary side of a trillion dollars over, over, uh, over 10 years. And we need to raise the debt limit again. We, you all remember how difficult it was last summer going through that. All of those are going to need revenue. And it's proven just incredibly hard to find revenue. That's why the, the grand bargain failed. 
uh, last summer. That's why the super committee failed. We were on the conference that was uh, extending the payroll tax relief, um, extending the unemployment insurance, and the only reason Congress succeeded there was to decide not to pay for it. Um, as these um, forces uh, uh, intersect, Congress is going to need to come up with revenue. A climate policy could raise a lot of revenue, and there are not a lot of good ways to raise revenue. And so I will come back to that at the end of, at the, um, uh, at the, end of the talk. But that's uh, a concept that we're starting to focus on and trying to build, uh, build support for. What I thought I would do um, is talk about, uh, here's what I thought I would talk about. One, my experiences with the Clean Air Act in 89, 90. That's the last time Congress passed major environmental legislation. And it's a good reference point for understanding how Congress can act when it's operating well and also what, what the difficulties are. Then talk about uh, the 2009, 2010 experience with the Waxman-Markey bill uh, in, some, in some detail. Then about what the current client Congress is like, which is just a, a disaster on environmental policy. And then come back to this intersection between climate policy and budget and why that uh, may be a ray of, um, of opportunity. It's really not that big a group here. So please, anyone have a question, just, uh, just interrupt. Uh, that the more informal would be the, would, would be the better uh, from, my, um, from my perspective. Uh, I started out with Waxman in, in uh, 89 as an environmental uh, council, the beginning of 89. 8990 was when we did the Clean Air Act. And so I was thrown right in the middle of that, uh, of that fight. And that, to me, I've now been a congressional staff, worked in the FDA for a year, but otherwise I've been in Congress for my career, so that's a long time as a congressional staff. That still, to me, exemplifies Congress as how it should work. That wasn't a partisan uh, battle over the Clean Air Act. Um, my boss was the leading proponent of a strong Clean Air Act in the House. The leading opponent on the other side was John Dingell. My boss was the chair of the Health and Environment Subcommittee, the Energy and Commerce Committee, which had the Clean Air Act jurisdiction. John Dingell was the chair of the full committee. Any legislation had to go through our subcommittee, but then had to go through Dingell's. Uh, there were many Republicans that were with Mr. Dingell and didn't want a strong bill, but there were a lot of Republicans that were with, uh, with Waxman and wanted a bill. Uh, members like Jerry Lewis, Republicans from California, were very strong advocates for reducing emissions from motor vehicles. Because in California, if you didn't get your emission reductions from motor vehicles, you had to do it from your factories and other stationary sources. Better to get it from motor vehicles. That's why Dingell was uh, such an opponent, because he represented Detroit. Uh, in the East, uh, you had members like Sherry Bullard from uh, upstate New York, where the sulfur emissions and nitrogen oxide emissions were coming from the Midwest and causing the acid rain problems. Uh, you had members from the Midwest, like Ed Madigan, from a rural area, and the opportunities for um, ethanol or ethanol blends to make fuel cleaner made him a, um, made, made him a, a, a good ally. The real difficulty was U.S. industry, uh, who was organized by Dingell. So in that, um, you had the car companies, and they didn't want anything on, and you had to, we had a big battle there to get tighter tailpipe standards. Then we had a big battle with the chemical industry, because we had a title that dealt with toxic emissions, and our laws for toxic pollution didn't work very well, and we fundamentally reformed them. They didn't like those, and they didn't like the program that we enacted to deal with the um, domestically with our emissions of CSCs, which were destroying the ozone layer. And they told us this would shut down hospitals and big buildings and a lot of American uh, industry. The oil companies didn't want to clean up their fuels, didn't want to clean up gasoline. And one of the most important things we did was require reformulation of gasoline. And the utilities were uh, opposed to the acid rain uh, program um, that, was, uh, that was there. Um, I should have mentioned uh, the President, George Bush, was a Start, what rant campaigned on a stronger Clean Air Act. So it was obviously a very important uh, uh, step that he did. And he put forward a terrific acid rain program that was stronger, more reductions, and less support for the utility industry than my boss had been advocating just a Congress or two before. So the utility company said, can't we have your bill that we fought so hard to defeat, can't we just have that instead of what, the, what President Bush had put forward? Um, we ended up, the members ended up reaching compromises. That brought the industry along. And we passed that uh, with over 400 votes. There's 435 members in the Congress. So it was overwhelming bipartisan support for major uh, environmental legislation. And that's how, in my mind, it, 
Congress, Congress should act. If I fast forward now to, um, uh, to, uh, to 2000 and, um, 2009, um, 2008, my boss was the, um, Waxman was the chair of the Gov Oversight and Government Reform Committee. That's the main investigative committee in the House. He was still a member of Energy and Commerce. He was the number two most senior Democrat. But he um, had been the ranking member, and then he'd just been the chairman for 2007-2008 of the Oversight Committee. When President Obama got elected, President Obama campaigned as two of his top priorities was health reform and a, and a new energy policy. And those were priorities that were very uh, important, central to Waxman's career. So he did something very unusual. He challenged John Dingell, who was the uh, longtime chair, uh, his great ally on health reform and his nemesis on, uh, often on energy uh, and, and environmental policies for the chairmanship. And it's, that's unusual to do. It's very unusual to win. But Waxman did win. And so he became the chair in 2009 of the um, Energy and Commerce Committee. I came over, came over with him. And we had a challenge then, because how are we going to do both health and, and energy policy? We had a strategy, which was to go out of the box very, very quickly with energy. Move that through our committee by May, have it through the floor in, uh, in June, and send it over to the Senate. Then be working, be working behind the scenes on health care. As soon as we're out of committee, move health care through the committee. We had a major part of that. Ways and Means also had a part in a third committee. Education and Labor had a part. Unite those things, pass those in the House. The Senate also was supposed to be on a strategy to pass their health reform over the, during the summer of 2009. Then you have the August recess, the staffs to work to begin to harmonize those bills, pass health reform in the fall. Then Copenhagen is, uh, conference is coming in the end of 2009, the beginning of 2010. That would be a driver for the Senate to be able to succeed on something on energy. So that was our strategy. It was obviously an ambitious strategy, but as one we thought had, um, had, had, had viability. In the end, it didn't play out that way. The Senate took much longer on health reform uh, to do, and health reform dragged out and then took, uh, took a, lot of the, um, uh, a lot of the oxygen out. When we started, it actually, there, there, there are reasons to be, in some ways, uh, a more favorable climate, more favorable environment for doing major environmental legislation in 2009 than there had been 20 years before when we were uh, starting the um, um, we were starting the Clean Air Act. And that was really because of the position that industry took. There was a group, U.S. CAP, U.S. Climate Action Partnership, which was a group of C CEOs of major industries. Um, they had ma CEOs of major utilities, all four auto companies, GE, Dow, uh, DuPont, Shell was part of it, BP was, uh, was part of it. Um, so major affected industries and some environmentalists. And they came in and, and they testified before us in January of 2009. They wanted Congress to enact a comprehensive uh, climate policy. The industry leaders told us There's, we're going to have to deal with this. There's uncertainty. We don't know how to make investments. Let us know the rules of the road so we can make our, um, uh, so, so we can make our, um, uh, we, can, we can make our investments. That was so different than our experience doing the Clean Air Act, where we were fighting. Here you had, here you, here you had allies. Um, they recommended that we use a model that was in the Clean Air Bill to deal with acid rain, which was cap and trade. Um, issue uh, allowances, require any major source of carbon emissions to, uh, to get a permit to get an allowance for every ton of emissions and control how many of those the government would issue and decrease them over time. And that's the model we, we used. We had a bill that would uh, decrease the number of allowances by 17 percent by 2020 and then by 80 percent by, um, uh, by, by 2050. We used some of those funds to stop to invest in uh, preventing tropical deforestation and we had some other mechanisms. So some estimates were we were going to get up to a 30% reduction by, um, uh, 
uh, by 2020 in U.S. Uh, emissions um, in the bill that we that we ended up passing uh, through the uh, through the House. What I thought I would do is um, uh, on, on this is go through in a little more detail some of the what we had to do on the on the Democratic side. It was very much like 2000, uh, like the Clean Air Act. It was very much a regional issue. You had members that were from coal producing regions. You had members that were from regions that used a lot of coal to generate electricity. You had members that represented heavy industry. We had members that were from Texas and other uh, areas uh, were oil and gas. And we had to work out um, uh, policies and compromises to deal with the concerns of those, um, uh, 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 those groups. Um, and I thought what I would do is sort of walk through some, some of that to give you a flavor of the, of the kind of issues we had to, we had to deal with and then, and then switch over to on the, um, on the, on the Republican side. Uh, what the issues were. Let me start first with, uh, um, with the electric utilities. And um, the, um, the, the utilities, there, was two, there were two primary concerns that, um, uh, that we heard. Uh, the, the biggest one was what was happened to electricity rates. And if you represented Seattle, the Pacific Northwest, you were all for and you were a Democrat, should have been even if you were, for a, if you were a Republican, but you were all for um, cap and trade because your electricity is generated from hydro sources. You don't have any emissions. But if you're in Ohio, you're in Indiana, you're in other states would get a lot of electricity from coal, they were worried about real, 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 um, uh, real rate increases um, uh, there. Um, s second, um, the utilities themselves were worried about utilities are what they can charge at the, the utility um, can charge the consumers regulated by the local PUC, Public Utility Commission. Um, but at least the part of the utility system, part of elect our electricity system that delivers electricity to households, to the end users, is a monopoly. We don't have competing companies with power lines serving a single city, so they have regulated rates. And they were concerned, are they going to be able to pass on their, their rate increases? They had had the experience in 2000, 2001, California energy crisis, when um, electricity rates skyrocketed. It turned out that was because of manipulation from uh, Enron and other electricity generators that were withholding power. But the major, the biggest utility in California went bankrupt, PG&E, because it couldn't pass on the rates. So they were concerned about that. We dealt with this by awarding um, uh, allowances to the utilities um, uh, for about, I don't know, 90% or so of their emissions. And we did that, um, and they didn't have to pay for it for a transition period that lasted to 2025 and then phased down over the next five years. So they would have to pay to reduce their emissions, but they didn't have to buy for the emissions they're going to emit that are that they're, that, that's um, lawful for them to admit, they didn't have to pay uh, to purchase allowances during this initial period. Afterwards, after you got through that transition, they'd have to buy uh, their, their allowances, which would raise revenue for the, for the federal, federal government. The coal industry was, um, uh, had some of the same uh, concerns, but was particularly, if you're a utility, you could switch to natural gas. You've got different options. If you're a coal miner, and it's your job, that's your job to, to coal. The future at that point really looked like it would be uh, carbon capture and sequestration for the coal industry. And so we had worked with, uh, particularly with Rick Boucher, who's a member from, um, uh, from uh, southwestern Virginia, very heavy coal area, uh, to develop a program where we would uh, pay through allowances for the first utilities that were developing carbon capture and sequestration. So we set aside 2 to 5 percent, depending on the year of allowances, to help uh, utilities that wanted to continue to burn coal do so in a way uh, that, would, um, uh, that would allow them to burn coal in a way that was environmentally, environmentally safe. The, um, uh, on the industrial sector, uh, the, the biggest problems 
were for companies like steel, which, uh, whose prices and, com and compete in a global market. So our steel companies are competing against each other, but they're also competing against China, Korea, and other, German, other, Germany, other places where they make steel. So that created a problem for them. If their costs are going up, and some ways you make steel use a lot of electricity, others, other, others, others less, but if their costs are going up, um, they're not going to be able to raise their prices because they're competing against, if they're particularly competing against other countries that aren't, don't have these costs. So we also used allowances um, during a transition uh, period here for, for these industries to, um, to uh, ease, their, ease their costs. We gave them allowances equivalent to the emissions that would be uh, tri attributable to, um, to, um, to their activities. The oil companies looked at this and said, that's a great deal. We want the same thing. Give us the, um, give us the allowances. They, it didn't make sense to do that um, from an economic standpoint. Um, the price of gasoline is set at the marginal cost of producing that next gallon of gas. And that's always going to be a cost. That's going to be a cost that reflects the cost of buying a carbon allowance. Somebody's going to produce that next increment is going to have to make the gasoline, but also the way the bill worked was we required the oil companies, the oil, uh, people who were introducing the fuel in the stream of commerce to have allowances for the carbon content of the fuel that they were inter introducing. We didn't have drivers who were the emitters have to get carbon allowances. It was the company selling them the fuel. But that price is going to reflect the price if they had to go out and buy a carbon allowance. So if we'd given them a lot of allowances, it would have been a great windfall for them. They'd be charging prices that would have reflected uh, them having to buy it without ha them having to buy it. So that transportation sector generally didn't get allowances. We still had to deal with members like Gene, uh, there was Gene Green and others that were from, uh, from, uh, from, from the region, and they, were, they could understand this point. Um, but they were concerned uh, about, uh, about the impacts on their industry, and they saw their industry, the refining operations, as actually a little bit like the steel makers. That from the, when they, people that are, there's also emissions when you refine your fuel, when you produce it, and um, those emissions would affect their costs of production. And they were concerned that um, uh, we had, if somebody imported, me, somebody imported fuel, they'd have to get an allowance for it. So it was a, more of a level playing field with, with imports there. But they were imported gasoline. But they were concerned if they had extra costs in the refining end. So we gave them some allowances to cover their refining emissions. That's small compared to the carbon content of the fuel. They didn't get allowances for the fuel, but they got allowances for a transition for the emissions that they would generate when they were refining so they could compete on an equal basis with refineries in Europe or wherever else might be Venezuela that might be importing fuel into the United, into the, into the United States. Um, it was through, we had other members that were concerned about the impacts on, um, on low income uh, communities. We had a lot of members that were like that so we set aside a stream of allowances to help uh, alleviate those and we used, had a, had a bunch left over that we invested in clean energy um, uh, and energy efficiency and, and others. Through um, a system like this, we were able to build support on the Democratic side sufficient to get it out of committee and ultimately uh, on the floor. Now, some people have looked back and they've said, that was really complicated. You should have done what you did in 1990 when you did the acid rain program that was so simple and clean and worked beautifully. And the acid rain program has worked great. The, the, the costs are about a tenth of what the industry was telling us. And there may be a fifth or a quarter of what, I forget the, the EPA's estimates were. Uh, and its emissions are, they, they, they easily met the standards we had in 1990. And, EPA through regulations has reduced them, I think, in um, two, two separate times, even, even below that. It's, so it's a program that's worked, that's worked terrifically. But it was not a simple program. Uh, I spent months working on the allowance system. Now, that was just for the utility sector. 
we had in that bill, I think over 50 different formulas for allowances. We had the, they were like earmarks. We would write, well, this is for some, one that's located on the east of the Mississippi River and serves a community of such and such size, get some extra amount of allowances. There, members were um, uh, intensely concerned about how their local utilities. So it, it, it's a program that looks great now, but it's very complicated the, uh, to, uh, to put together. The utility industry, when we did the bill in, um, in uh, 2009, actually learned from that, and they came to us with a formula how to allocate the allowances. And they said, do half of the allowances based on your emissions, your historical emissions. That's good for the coal burning utilities. And, um, but some utilities had felt they had already acted to clean up. They had already invested in maybe a new natural gas facility, even though it's a little more expensive than a coal facility would be. They didn't want to be penalized for that. So they said, do the other half based on electricity generation. And we just used that simple formula. The there's, utility industry has mainly privately owned generators. There's some municipal owned generators. And then there's a small called the rural co-ops that are pretty small. They thought they couldn't live with the um, uh, formula that the private industry negotiated, the, the privately owned, um, investor owned uh, uh, utilities. So we did a little extra formula for them. And there, there was, it, but it was overall it really wasn't all that. It, it was complicated because we had to deal with the industrial sector. We had to deal with coal interests. We had to deal with the, the refiners because um, we're doing a broader bill. But it was um, one, by and large, if I looked at it, I would say 90% of what we did with the allowances was good, sound policy. And there would be 10% that was there that was you're, you're trying to deal, how you're going to put together the coalition um, to, uh, to do it. What was different, though, though so what was so different was the Republican uh, reaction to it. In a lot of ways, I think it was just like what happened in health care. In the health care bill, the heart of the health care bill is an individual mandate to get health reform. It's a way to get not sort of two options to do if you're going to give coverage to everybody. One is you can expand Medicare, which is what Democrats really wanted to do, a single-payer approach, tax people, and then uh, provide a government-provided health reform and that can be very efficient and low cost. Or there was the Republican model to get there, which was through an individual mandate, which is how you, you could do that, then you can make insurance companies insure everybody. But even though it was a Republican idea, when we did health reform, Republicans lined up uniformly against it for, I think, political reasons as much as anything. And we had exactly the same reaction on, on, uh, on energy. We ended up, I think, getting eight Republican votes. So whereas when we did clean air, we got hundred, you know, the vast majority of Republicans here we were able to get just um, uh, to get to get just eight. We did remarkably stay on our schedule. We were out of committee in May. Um, Speaker Pelosi was just um, uh, tenacious in uh, and incredibly effective in building the support through the caucus to move this uh, through the floor. And so we did this before the Fourth of July recess. We were we were out. We were on 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 our on our schedule there. Um, what happened in the Senate was what I alluded to before. Health reform was the number one priority of the administration to do, I think appropriately. Um, and it took them much longer to get their health reform bill through. Senator Baucus and Senator, in, in the, there are two committees. There's the Health Committee, Health Education, Labor and Pensions. They acted in the early summer. I think maybe in, in June they acted. Maybe it was July, early July, or else it was June. But Senator Baucus kept trying to forge an agreement with Senator Grassley and other Republicans. And it would be a daily thing in the morning. They were very close. In the afternoon, it fell apart. And the next morning, it would seem close. And that was it would be obvious benefits to have a bipartisan bill if you could get it. We couldn't, couldn't be achieved um, in the Senate. The health reform then made it through the committees in, in, uh, in October, went to the floor in the Senate in December. Um, we were working very hard um, at the White House to try to 
put that bill together with the Senate, and then there was the Scott Brown election, and all of a sudden that made the um, vastly complicated the effort. Whereas in January we'd figured out how to reconcile and deal with lots of policy concerns. There was after Scott Brown's election, there was only one legislative way to move this through, which was for the House, which had majority, to pass the Senate bill absolutely intact. The Senate bill had lots of flaws in it, and it wasn't passed to be a final, uh, the, the final vehicle. Um, it was passed to get through. You had to pass that, then you had to try to fix it in something called budget reconciliation. Those had very narrow rules. They only could deal with revenue, raising or spending revenue. So lots of policies or health policies didn't have a direct connection or harder to deal with. That whole process took us uh, all the way to the end of March. And it also took, uh, it was a very uh, bruising process. And there really was no, uh, uh, some people have said, that, well, the president should have at that point really been pushing, pushing for energy policy. It was just, it was hard to make a case where, um, there would be a, um, to how you could actually uh, drive that, that, that forward very, very effectively. Uh, there was some point, maybe the BP uh, spill uh, in the Gulf uh, could do rally enough, but it didn't, it never kind of coalesced, um, coalesced that way. So that was, it, um, it was a great effort in the House and an effort that was never, despite terrific efforts by members like Senator Kerry and Lieberman and Bar Barbara Boxer, uh, to move forward, it was never able to, 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 to get through the uh, Senate. That brings then to the 2010 elections. Democrats lose, have a very bad election. We lose control in the House. Um, my boss goes from being the chairman to being the ranking member of the, um, of the committee and uh, unleashes in the House the current uh, uh, attacks that we've seen on environmental policy, including climate policy. And, and my, I started out in uh, 88 on the Hill, went to Waxman in, in 89, so I was in the majority until the 94 elections, in a long period in the minority, then back in the majority. Hope, hope it'll flip back at some point soon. Um, during most of the time I was in the minority, there was often hostility towards environmental regulations, environmental programs, but it was usually disguised. So a typical kind of battle we would have on a, is it would be couched in a regulatory reform clothing. Instead of saying EPA can't control mercury emissions or can't control toxic emissions uh, here from mines or something else, but say it needs to do more science, needs to do a bunch of more cost-benefit analysis, and those have to be, should be subject to judicial review. And so you get a process that would make it very hard for the regulatory process to, to actually succeed. That was all the experience until this last, this last year when the attacks were direct, frontal, there was no camouflage, there was, there was no disguise. We kept a, um, a, a database of the anti-environment votes in the, um, uh, in the, in the House. And last year, there was 191, um, 191 votes. Let me, I'll just give you some of the statistics because they're pretty remarkable. The, um, so we, we voted to uh, block actions to prevent air pollution, to strip EPA of authority to enforce water pollution standards, to stop the Department of Interior from identifying lands suitable for wilderness designations, to allow oil and gas off the coast of Florida, California, and other states opposed to drilling, to slash funding for the Department of Energy to support removal and clean energies by more than 80 percent. There were 191 of these anti-environment votes on the floor. 114 went after EPA, 35 went after the uh, Department of Interior, 31 uh, targeted the um, Department of Energy. Last year, uh, 2011, we had um, 770 legislative roll call votes. Sometimes you vote things by voice. Um, and 22% of those, more than one out of every five, was one of these votes to undermine environmental uh, protection. 
And they were really <coughs> partisan votes. 94% of Republican members voted for the anti-environment position and 86 members percent of the Democrats voted for the pro-environment um, position. And climate change was a big target, one of the biggest bullseyes of all. There was like 27 different um, uh, uh, votes that was there. In December of 2009, the Supreme Court ruled in 2007, is that right? The Mass ruled that uh, EPA has authority over the, um, to regulate CO2, carbon dioxide, if EPA would find that it endangered health and, and welfare. And EPA made that scientific endangerment finding in, uh, in 2009 that uh, elevated levels of greenhouse gases were a danger. And all the world's leading scientific organizations had um, uh, found exactly the uh, same thing, including our National Academy of Sciences on multiple, on multiple occasions. But we passed early in, in the year a, a bill to overturn the EPA's scientific endangerment finding. And in that, uh, uh, Waxman had an amendment on the floor. It was a very simple one. It stated, Congress accepts the scientific findings of the Environmental Protection Agency that climate change is occurring, is caused largely by human activity, and poses significant risk for public health and welfare. And that was essentially verbatim from the conclusions of the most recent National Academy of Science uh, report. And all but one uh, House Republican voted to reject, um, uh, reject that finding. Um, there wasn't a lot of, the, some Republicans were just deniers completely. We had reached early when we were in the 2009 when we tried to um, pass our climate bill. Chairman Waxman met with his then ranking member who was Joe Barton from Texas and said, can we work together on part of this bill? And Mr. Barton said, well, that would be a problem. I don't believe in climate change. It's just a myth. I can't help you pass this. I can't have any discussion. So some members had that position. Other ones said the science wasn't settled. But at the same time members were saying the science wasn't settled, House Republicans were voting to uh, slash funding for climate research uh, in the, in the uh, House. And they even enacted into a law, one of the, we, basically most of these votes went over to the Senate and just died. But every once in a while one went through. One, the, the NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, wanted to create a climate service sort of like the National Weather Service, which has been great because it's a central, centralizes their, 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 it's a place people go to, and they thought they could be more, more effective in communicating and more efficient with taxpayer resources, and they were blocked from doing that. Um, EPA had uh, um, recently just uh, came out with their proposal to regulate uh, emissions from new, new power plants. We had votes to block those. The argument we heard there was, which was an understandable one, the U.S. shouldn't act unilaterally. We'll be at a competitive disadvantage if the U.S. acted unilaterally. Uh, but at the same time, the House was voting to prevent unilateral U.S. action. We were also voting to prevent international uh, U.S. action. So we voted to completely defund the State Department's negotiators uh, to the international climate uh, negotiations. We voted in the House to completely defund any U.S. contribution to the IPCC the Intergovernmental Panel for, uh, uh, for, for Climate Change. And we voted to make it illegal for U.S. airlines to comply with the European requirement to get, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to get allowances for your emissions uh, and flights uh, to uh, Europe. It, so it was just dreadful legislatively. And it was just as bad from an oversight perspective. There's always been, up until this last Congress, a bipartisan consensus that we should be supporting um, uh, solar energy, wind energy, other kind of clean energies. Republicans had it, called it all, all of the above. And even there were members who, and there were lots of them, didn't, wouldn't want to regulate, would at least want to try to have some government uh, uh, in, incentives to support this. And so we had loan guarantee programs that were enacted in the Bush, in the, under the Bush administration, bipartisan support to allow um, the Department of Energy to support these fledging technologies. Along came Solyndra. Are you all familiar with the basic facts on Solyndra? It's a, it's a solar panel manufacturer. The investigations were in our, in, in our committee, and they got a $500 million loan, loan guarantee. The, uh, one of the investors in Solyndra is um, 
the family charitable foundation of a guy named George Kaiser, who's a, uh, a Oklahoma oil and gas, um, uh, owns oil and gas interests, and was a big campaign contributor to, uh, to, to President Obama. And that's sort of what started the investigation with a theory that Solyndra got a lot of taxpayer money as a favor to, to, uh, to, George, to, George, to George, George Kaiser. Those facts never panned out. In fact, I've done a lot of investigation because I'm on the Oversight Committee, and, and George Kaiser was one of the most ethical. We got to see all his internal emails. He had people telling him, you've got to go lobby the White House. We need more help here. You've got good connections there. Go lobby the White House. And it, this is his own people that are, that are there telling him. And he says, no, I'm not going to do this. I have charitable interests, early childhood education, energy policy, unrelated to, to Solyndra. I, I want my contacts. I don't want to contaminate my relationship. It's there. You, you know, Solyndra, you hire your own lobbyists to, uh, to, deal, to deal with this. Uh, the whole program was designed to, um, uh, to uh, support emerging technology, some of which would fail. So in the, um, in the uh, 2009 st stimulus bill, the Recovery Act, we set aside, I think it's about $4 billion to the way the original loan guarantee program worked was if you want a loan guarantee and you, the Department of Energy thought you were worthwhile, you could get it, but the taxpayer is taking on some risk because you might fail. And you had to pay the, called the credit subsidy cost. You had to pay uh, a fee to get the loan guarantee to compensate the government for the risks of its loan guarantee. In the 2009 Recovery Act, we, Congress appropriated $4, million, $4 billion to pay those costs for certain types of technologies. And so the company could get the loan guarantee, wouldn't pay the fee. The fee would, in essence, be deducted out of the $4 billion pot. And the idea was that, that would, those, would, you know, those, those are risks that we might actually end up be, uh, uh, taking and uh, compensate if they, if they, uh, if they, uh, if they fail. Uh, there's now been an audit of the program. It looks like the $4 billion is going to be used up in part, but not all, which is what the program was supposed to do. In any case, we had a series of hearings. The message the Republicans took out of this is that the, or that they, they, the rhetoric they've been using is the government shouldn't pick winners and losers in the marketplace. So supporting solar energy, supporting wind energy is in an inappropriate role um, uh, for the government because that's intervened to pick winners, winners, winners and losers. That's a message that obviously works great for the entrenched uh, industries, it makes it very difficult for new industries that need, may need some government support. So it's been just overall a, um, a dismal year for someone, and I'm a, I, uh, these are issues I care personally a, a lot about, my boss is passionate about it, it's been a, it's been a dismal year just trying to, to, trying to defend those. Um, but I said at the outset that um, um, uh, there's a path forward. And the path forward doesn't have anything to do that my, Congressman Waxman wrote an op-ed about this in the Washington Post in, in February. He wrote with Ed Markey, his partner in 2009. And then we worked, tried really hard to find Republicans to, to write it with. He couldn't find any current Republicans, but, but two retired ones were, were really eager, Sherry Bullard and Wayne Gilchrist um, from, uh, from Maryland, uh, Bullard from, from New York. And what they said is we have two long-term problems facing our nation. Our fiscal problems, the debt, which if it keeps growing is going to have real problems, and our climate problem, and they're easier to solve um, uh, together. If you listen to the budget experts like the Simpson-Bowles Commission, they say we need to reduce our federal spending or increase our revenues by um, $4 trillion over the next 10 years. That's off of, when you get in these budget things, the, your, your, your baseline becomes very important. That's a baseline that assumes current policies, not the export. So if we continue the Bush tax cuts, for instance, um, uh, if you look to current policy you continue, we'd have to either raise or cut spending by $4 trillion. That's incredibly difficult to do. If we let the Bush tax cuts for the wealthy expire, which is a central plank for President Obama and Democratic members, that's only $800 billion. If you turn Medicaid into a block grant and dramatically cut the federal support for Medicaid so it's no longer an entitlement, which is what they 
the Ryan budget that the House just passed did, that's only $800 billion. You still have a long way to go. And uh, it's, there's not good, good options that's there. When we have now been talking to economists about this idea, and they say, well, you know, that if you're trying it from a policy standpoint, going to a carbon tax or selling carbon allowances, sell, instead of allocating those permits, giving them away, selling them, there couldn't be a, it'd be a great way to, to, to it'd be very good for, for our economy, better than, stronger for our economy than raising income taxes, stronger for our economy than cutting, cutting spending. Be, be very good. So the policy is great. And they ask, well, the politics. How is the politics ever going to work on this? And the politics are terrible uh, for it right now. There's not, no, there's no, my boss is talking about it, but no, very, virtually no one who's running for election is talking about it. But we do have a forcing mechanism that's, that, that's, that's coming because at the end of the year, and, and, and the Federal Reserve Chairman, um, Bernanke's talked about it as a, as a fiscal cliff. But there are a number of things that happen at the end, at the end of this year. And um, let me just go, go through these with you. Um, first, all of the Bush era tax cuts expire, not just those for the wealthy, for everybody. Um, so that's um, um, rates increase across the board. Marriage penalty relief is, uh, is, um, re is, 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 is lost. Um, uh, child tax credits and earned income tax credits are, are slashed. Um, the uh, uh, programs that you all may be using to help uh, fund your education, those, those disappear. And that's $2.8 trillion. Um, as part of the, uh, the, uh, the, the budget deal that was done in July when the grand bargain fell apart, um, we raised the debt limit and then said, we're going to create a super committee to come up with a plan to reduce spending or increase revenues by $1.2 trillion, which was close to the amount we raised the, the, the debt limit. At the, I think we did a little bit of a down payment. The super committee they said, if we don't do it, there's going to, if the super committee fails, which it did, there'll be a sequester of that amount over 10 years, half from defense, half from domestic spending. So that hits. That's, a, that's an additional $1 trillion. There are t other tax provisions that expire. The AMT, the alternative minimum tax, which is always there's a fix for, that, that, ex that, 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 that expires. The payroll tax relief that Congress just did in, um, in February, if there's an effort to, that expires. Um, there are tax breaks members favor, like for research and development. Those expire. There's tax breaks for, uh, for wind energy. Um, and other clean energy that expire. So those things all is another $2.3 trillion. We have another costly thing, which is how you pay doctors on, in the Medicare program called the SGR, which is a, was put in place in the 97 budget and it's always waived in one way or another. It's, the way it would operate now is if Congress doesn't waive it, it's, um, it would, and, you, and you try to uh, fix that. Uh, so, so um, and come up with the revenue to pay doctors what they should be paid other than if we do nothing, doctors will face a 30% cut for serving Medicare. It's a devastating thing for Medicare patients. Fixing it's a, a $270 billion. And you add all that up and that's $7 trillion new revenues or spending, spending cuts. So you might say, well, that's great. We had only need to get to $4 trillion, and we're going to get to $7 trillion if we do nothing. But the problem is that would be a tremendous economic shock to the economy. Um, the estimates that I've seen is it's, that's sort of around 3% of GDP, which is just, it would be a trillion dollars over two years, the first two years. And we, our economy can't sustain that. So Congress has to act. It's going to have to come up. And the last thing is the debt limit needs to be extended again around this time. So Congress is going to have to act. And if if there's, I guess we can just kick things down the road, but that's going to be a difficult thing. There's going to be a lot of pressure on the Republican side and on the Dem Democratic side not to do that because the numbers, the long-term debt numbers don't look good. So we're going to have to come up with, with revenue sources. If you did a carbon tax at $20 a ton, that's a trillion, over a trillion dollars over 10 years. And it's a very good alternative. And the other alternatives are terrible alternatives. No one wants to raise the income taxes. No one wants to, aside from the 
guess there's some Tea Party. Uh, but, but the public doesn't and members broadly don't want to deeply slash Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid. Defense spending, people are up in arms about the sequester. So that's not an area for, for additional cuts. And it's in that dynamic and that's what, what, what my boss and some others have started to talk about as an opportunity here to really make a significant uh, move forward on climate policy. It won't be driven by concern about uh, climate, but it'll be driven by how else do you get, how else do you get the revenues. That's the, 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 what I thought would make sense to cover is a little bit of past and, and future, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. Thank you for speaking with us. I'm really interested in this topic. How do you get past the, I mean, I, I think your idea makes a lot of sense. How do you get past the politics and the fact that some of these politicians have already said that climate change isn't happening and they've already been outspoken about it? How do you make it so politically they can do something that supports climate action? Are you still calling it something related to climate or do you call, do you call it something else, something related to energy efficiency? Or how do you get past the politics? Well, there, it I think you're really, it's really looking at what the alternatives are, which is it's a lesser, it's a lesser evil. So for, for those members, um, there's a lot of tax cuts that are expiring and they're gonna wanna retain some of those tax cuts. And there's got to be a way to pay for doing that. And so how do you, how, how do you pay for it? Now, the answer on the, on the Republican side is don't pay for it. Let's just cut, cut, cut. But that's not, the president's not going to go for that. So there's going to be, how do you, it's in that, what's the alternative? It's not, it's not going to be a sale for someone that this is a, a good thing. If you looked at it from, from a real Republican standpoint, and um, they may say, well, let's not do incomes. This is some, Repu on the Republican economists, they would like to have a consumption tax if you have to have a tax. Carbon tax takes you in that direction. So if you're trying to think there's a, there, is, there a, is there a way where there could be some appeal, it's not going to be an appeal doing the right thing. Although for, for a lot of members, I personally believe they have a view that they're saying where it is. It's very, it's a very, members have to, there's some members have positions and they also understand what the science is. But it's not going to be driven by that, it's going to be driven by what's the alternative. Yeah. So, I guess to follow up on that, if I'm, if I'm on record saying that I don't believe in climate change, I believe it's all a hoax, and I'm now talking with my constituents and they ask me, why do you support this tax on something that you don't believe is a problem? I mean, you can say, well, I, we need revenue from somewhere, but why, like, if carbon is not a problem at all, why should there, why should we even be talking about it? You know, that, it seems to me like just from the media, that would be the, the way that the conversation is going to go. So they need some way to explain not just that we need revenue from somewhere, but that it should be from this, right? Yeah. The, um, uh, the answer, I think, there is they can also have a room full of seniors where we've raised the, the Medicare age and we've dramatically increased the premiums that seniors have to pay for Medicare. Or they've got their defense bases in their district and we've got a big cut on defense spending. Or income taxes are going up. If the, if the, if the, if the Bush tax cuts expire, everybody's income tax goes up by a good bit. So they have a lot of unhappy people about all of those all of those, all of those issues, and there's going to be a compromise. It's not going to, there's not going to be for Tea Party members not going to be able to go back and say there's not, any, there's no possibility of this. I believe politically that, that we got, I got the policy I wanted to get here, and and revenue didn't go up. There's not. I mean, maybe, maybe I should, maybe I should qualify that. If it's a very good Republican year, and um, uh, President Obama is defeated. The Senate goes Democratic. There's not you know, big gains in the there's not gains in the House. There are, there are political situations that would change that where the the uh, uh, Tea Party type Republicans could feel they, with some justification they have the ability to do whatever they, they want to do. But if there's a situation where President Obama's reelected, now he's not talking about this policy, but he's definitely talking. He talked yesterday very dramatically about social Darwinism and what is wrong with the Republican budget. 
those things that he's talking about doing aren't things that Republicans want to do. And they, if they, they, to the extent Republicans have been out there on, I don't believe in carbon, that's here. To the extent they've been out here and don't raise people's taxes and what they've been saying to the constituents is up here. And they've signed pledges and other things with Grover Norquist. So if they've got to deal with, you know, problems about my past position and what, and how do I justify it, I think, I don't want, I'm not trying to dismiss what you're saying, but they have, I think, bigger problems, and they're going to have bigger problems in this, in this, in this big package. Yeah? Well, how do you talk to the um, regressivity argument of this, that folks will say there's a, a great deal of uh, inelasticity within the energy market? Lots of folks are buying energy, and these costs are going to be passed directly on to consumers. And there's not ne necessarily that much variation amongst low income versus high income co consumers. It's sort of a baseline consumption of energy. So it's a $20 you know, per ton tax on carbon. You know, folks who are, have to try to work every day because they live out in the exurbs because that's the only place they could afford a home that's currently underwater, aren't those people going to be disproportionately impacted? I can see that being an argument. How do we count on that? There, um could give a couple of responses to it. One, it's uh, something we're trying to take a look at right now. My, my boss has said to us as staff, um, he want, wants a strategy to make. This was not on the table remotely when we did the grand bargain. It wasn't when we did the super committee. And there are problems you need to, f you need to figure out. They will t it's, it's, um, um, and so we are talking to entities like the Center on Budget Policy and Priority that care deeply about these issues, about how do you, how do you, how do you deal with them. Part, you may need to use some parts of the revenue that's raised to ameliorate that. But also, you need to look at this. There are, t this is one of the things that, that's, that's from, from Waxman's perspective, so important about this. Medicaid is on the chopping block. Medicare is on the chopping block. The child tax credit, the earned income tax credit. There are lots of things that are expiring that are tremendously important parts of our safety net that are in that are, that, are, that are in jeopardy either because that's where the Republicans want to go or that are in jeopardy because they just, they just expire. And so if you're in a context of trying to do all these things, you have to figure out, well, if you all of a sudden had an extra trillion dollars, and you could, this number can be dialed also a lot smaller than that. If it's 500 billion or 200, 200 billion, that, that could be saving some cuts that would be significantly more um, regressive in their impact. Than a, than, a, than, a, than a price on carbon. Yeah. Well, this all sounds very logical. But as we followed the debate during the grand bargain, there's a large constituency who says it doesn't matter. Um, we want to cut spending. It's an irrational mantra that it has to be cut spending that seems to be totally oblivious to the impact of the child care credit or as, you know, all the numerous programs. How do you get through in a logic, if logic isn't working? Well, there's, the dynamic will be, the, if, if President Obama is reelected, the dynamic is pretty different. Number one, he's reelected, he's not running again. Mm -hmm. But number two, all the, the Bush tax cuts are all expiring. There is this massive amount of increase. There's a historic, unprecedented increase in government, government revenue. When we're doing the grand bargain, the Republicans weren't facing that. Now that we were facing the, the possibility of default. And you know, that was, that, that it wasn't facing that the, the default operative is going to be $7 billion more. Now those numbers I read, the. Um, 270 billion comes from cutting doctors' pay. I think almost all the rest are from increased revenue. So it's a massive amount of uh, increased revenue that happens automatically, and that's a different dynamic. If you're a Republican member, that doesn't mean that the answer is going to everybody's going to go. Oh, it's going to be a carbon proposal that's there, but it means for those who want to say it's only do this through cutting. If you pass something and the president doesn't sign it, there's a trillions and trillions of revenue increases. And so that gives, I think, changes the dynamics and that will change that dynamic of the negotiation. Yeah. Um, <coughs> are you explaining to me? I was going to, go ahead, yes, sir. Okay. Um, is it likely, I got a couple of questions that will relate to the other. 
is it likely that any serious action is going to be in the lame duck session? Yeah. On, this, on, this, on these all things? Do you think there's any that's chance? A, that's a really good, that's a, that's a very good, good, good question because, and it's one I don't know, really know the answer to. It's, I think the, let me tell you things that people say. One, a lot of these hit in the lame duck. So you need some way to do it. On the other hand, trying to do really major policy changes, put, car put carbon aside, just the tax changes that need to be done, in the lame duck is very difficult. So that would logically say maybe there's a mechanism that Congress pushes this over, defers these into, into, in, in, into, the, into the next year at some point, figure out some mechanism to do some down payment and then push it over. But that's, there's no one, I'm saying that just as an informed observer with not any kind of insight, in, insight about how that would happen. I'm not sure anyone really knows how that, how, that will, how that will work out. There's so much focus on getting through this year in the election. I'm just wondering if in the lame duck session there have been enough changes in the Congress coming up uh, through retirements, through defeats, through redistricting, that enough people who are leaving would do the right thing, quote, um, and get some necessary things passed as opposed to uh, uh, letting it all fall apart? Uh, is, that, is that a possibility? And sometimes it happens like that, in my experience, where you have some messy things and, and say there's an opportunity before the new Congress comes to, to do that. But other times, there's just the, the, the dynamics change, people coming in and want to deal with it. And you, and you could easily have a situation where House Democrats think they have a very good chance to retake the House. I think that's not the conventional wisdom. But suppose they just we pick up seats, we stay in the minority. The president's reelected. I don't know which way the Senate. You know, the Senate. The Senate. The goes. signs of that are pretty good at the moment. If you, yeah, for, but things, for, for Obama to be. Uh, things change. Things change a lot. But if you're in that situation, then you know they could say, well, let's you know that's that's it's let's just push it off and deal with it ne next year. But yeah. you, you said that. There are some things that you can't push off. You can't push off. You'd have to do that as short. You'd have to do it as a short, some kind of short-term okay. measure. You have to do it some sort of short-term measure. Yeah. So, uh, could you talk a little bit about how Massachusetts versus EPA affected the legislative dynamics? Were people concerned about how how regulation under the Clean Act would be happening? I mean, some people, when the court ruled that the EPA needed to be regulating you know, said, oh, this is just a shot across the bow of Congress. Now they really have to do something. Um, but that's not obviously how it played out. So I was just wondering how, how members were it, thinking about it. It was a tremendously significant part of the 2009 discussion. And one of the ways in which members who, on the Democratic side, were dealing with the regional issues were ending up thinking about why it made sense to be for this comprehensive bill was um, it would be an alternative and a, and a better way to deal with this problem than EPA regulation was. And we struggled a lot with what are we going to do with EPA regulation. And you had industry wanted just to say, let's go to this market-based cap and trade and repeal any EPA uh, authority. Um, what we ended up doing was um, Retaining full EPA authority for the sources that were not the big power plants and that were going to be regulated in the, in the cap and trade system. For the power sector, we wrote into, we <coughs> took away EPA's authority to sort of discretionary authority to set standards for power plants. And we wrote into law standards that required power plants to move to carbon capture and, uh, and, 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 and storage. I think if you were built in a Everyone had to have carbon capture issues. Any new plants had to have it by, if you were going to install it when you were first starting after enactment, you'd have funding to, to do it. You could also, I think the way we did it was you could build a power plant if you wanted to, but you would have to, if you did it that way, you get no federal funding in like 2025, you'd have to retrofit. There's actually some parallels to what we had in the bill to what the EPA proposal is now. The EPA proposal for new power plants says their emissions have to be equivalent to what you get from a, a very clean natural gas uh, fired power plant. 
So a coal power plant can't make it unless it had carbon capture and sequestration. But what EPA has done in this proposal to provide some flexibility is said, if you're a coal burning power plant, a new one, this only applies to new plants, we will average your compliance over 30 years. So one way you could be in compliance is to build your plant without capturing your CO2 emissions, and then inst but install that, commit to install that 10 years out, and then control, over control, control like 80%. And that would get you, if you average that out over 30 years, that was not too far off really from what we had in, in the bill that passed the House, how to deal with it. So it was really important. I think it'll continue to be important. It's, EPA has a lot of tools to, uh, to, to use to, to deal with these problems. They're not as, this is a great problem to, do, to deal with through a market-based mechanism. It just would be, it's, it's, it's not local problems that are caused. It's more, it's not even, sometimes it's global problems. But if you can't get it that way, EPA could do it. And that, I think, over time is going to be a driving force as, as people look at it, to it and say, well, that's another reason to act. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so as between the two market-based mechanisms, the traditional understanding has been that, well, lots of people think a carbon tax is preferable, including like every economist. Um, the, uh, you know, cap and trade is more politically feasible, A, because you can give away allowances based on historical emissions, and B, you can give them away, and that you said 10 percent was a little iffy, right? You can do favors with, with giving away allowances. Um, if this is going to be a, a budgetary savior, you can't give away all the allowances. You've got to auction them off. And so we're talking about a carbon tax or cap and trade with auctioned off allowances. Um, and that makes the, the comparison look quite different. I mean, at this point, you know, which, which route is it that you're really talking about? And can you, in fact, honestly imagine a, an actual carbon tax? Well, they call the tax. Let me, let me address that in a couple of ways. One, you can, um, we tried to do a little bit just of a thought exercise. Um, is that, well, let me I think the big point, this is driven by budget concerns. It's not driven by, so it may have tax be more viable in that context than it would be, yeah. because it's not, this would not be driven by the environmental. But we looked at it, what if you gave industry everything that they got in 2009? And you could do that either through a tax by, you don't tax their first emissions, you only tax their, their emissions after a certain point, or you could do it through allowances. Give industry everything they got in 2009, take the other, what's left over, and we ended up giving industry about 60% of the allowances during this phase in period. Take the other and use half of it for clean energy. And only use that last for deficit. That's still $200 billion for deficit reduction. Now, in 2009, we didn't take that last bit and use it for deficit reduction. So there are ways, depending on how this played out, where you could do a significant amount of uh, assistance to industry and still raise a significant amount of money. It just wouldn't be as much money. At this point, um, what Congressman Waxman and the Ed Markey and those you're talking about are saying, they're trying to start a conversation and trying to uh, uh, raise the, uh, have people thinking about this idea and why it would make a lot of sense in the context of the fiscal problems that we're facing, as opposed to having a, he does not have a, a concrete uh, solution. Um, he, I think, if you asked him on policy grounds, he wouldn't, he, the thing you get when you do, an, you all know this, when you do an allowance system, a cap, you get the environmental certainty, and then the market sets the price. When you do a tax, you've got the businesses have the cost certainty, but you don't know where you're going to end up um, in, environmentally. He approaches this fundamentally from an environmental point of view, and so that would lead him, you know, one thing, but he's, he's said clearly in this discussion, the issue for him is not tax versus allowance. It's we we just have a, sh a short window. The um, IAEA did a uh, or not the IEA, the International Energy Agency, did a report in November about uh, what the world is facing, and it was really pretty interesting how they looked at this. They, and I hadn't seen anyone quite do this. They looked at for every factory, every power plant, what is it going to operate through its natural life how much emissions would it put up in the atmosphere. So it could attribute to anything. That's how much CO2 over its natural life. And it said in five years, globally, the installed capacity of power plants and factories will emit over its useful life 
all the CO2 that the atmosphere can hold without crossing over the danger level of 2 degrees centigrade warming. warming. So that meant at five years, if we're going to try to keep the level that the experts are saying is safe, the only way you could build something new is either make it zero emitting like solar or wind or retire something before it's useful life. And so costs just, um, you know, just, just, just skyrocket. Um, I think the estimate in that report was by 2020, it's four times more expensive to deal with our problems than if we start now. That is, so from, from Waxman's perspective and members of Think Like Him, that's motivating him is we really ought to put something in place soon while there's still some, instead of having all these cheap emissions go up into the atmosphere and what mechanism is maybe less important than, than, the, than, than acting quickly. Yeah. I, I, um, I'm just curious to know from somebody who's inside of these political discussions whether uh, a border tax adjustments uh, reflecting the CO2, possible CO2 legislation in the U.S. has ever been discussed. And it seems like that would be, that would definitely fall somewhere in the political trading going on. So I'm just curious. We, um, uh, there was a border tax, this is to deal with the issue of, um, the trade vulnerable industries like the steel, the steel industry. And how do you, if, they're, if you're going to deal with CO2 emissions here, it's an added cost to them and their competitive disadvantage. The way we, we thought a lot about this in 2009 and spent some time, there's a lot of appeal because also we could have preserved allowances too and used them for other purposes to instead of giving the steel company some allowances to, to make up for their costs, to say that steel coming in, we're going to put a some kind of tariff that reflects the carbon content in, 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 that, in that product. And, it, and so that was the logic of it. I think we had some, when it got to Ways and Means, they had that to be considered by the president and maybe some authority to do it without a mandate to, to do it. So we, we had some that was in there. It, in terms of actually requiring it, it's a very complicated thing. If you think of a car and it's made in Europe where they've got a good program so they shouldn't be subject to this, but some of the steels come from China and what's the and something else has come from somebody and trying to track all the stuff, it was very difficult to see how it actually wasn't implementable. So that was the conclusion we came to at that point that we couldn't figure out how to how to really make it work. But politically, just a very brief follow up, politically with respect to Republicans' opposition, is that anything which can get traction or just well, so practically I understand it's very hard. Uh, no, it was, be, it was, it was uh, uh, politically, it's great. The, the, the problem we faced, it wasn't Republicans didn't want to engage on their regional interests, but for the members like Mike Doyle, who um, comes from Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh area, cared a lot about steel. This was a huge issue for him and members that looked to him as, as leader on this. How do you solve this issue? So the companies that are so vital to economic growth in his district uh, weren't competitively disadvantaged. And a border adjustment would have been a way to do it. It's a way to do it that wouldn't have involved using allowances. So there'd be a lot of appeal if it was, if it was workable. We went the, uh, went the other way. Politically, it was great. In that case, in working it through, you know, we never got to engage with the problems. They just never got to the line of they wanted to engage. OK, yeah, last question. Um, I was just wondering real quickly what if you have any opinions on uh, national clean energy standards, which is another uh, bill that's been proposed, I believe, in the Senate now, um, I suppose it, it wouldn't raise any revenues. So it, would be, it would not help with the revenue problems that you, that you brought up here. Um, but being revenue neutral, it seems like it may encounter less resistance uh, from some sections. If you're trying to, the, the um I probably shows a good, maybe a good question to, to, to end on because uh, we're focused on the fiscal cliff we're headed and is there a role to advance climate policy there. We may miss that. It may not happen then. Could be for questions you, you raised earlier. People just don't want to deal with carbon, so it just doesn't happen. So then you're looking, what are you going to do? You, you, this opportunity doesn't pan out. What do you do? Then you're trying to do something in this policy area that is probably moving on its own. And that the president moved from doing a cap and trade to doing a clean energy standard, which requires utilities to generate a certain amount of their, uh, their electricity from wind, solar, nuclear, natural gas, clean, clean.
clean, clean sources. It doesn't raise revenue. It can be a very beneficial environmental policy. And that may be where things coalesce if, if, this is, if the window to deal with in a fiscal crisis is missed. And then you still, members like my boss are still going to want to deal with this problem. And then they're going to have to do it and it may be say, well, the politics are, can't do a, a carbon cap and trade or carbon tax on its own. But maybe this is a way to do it. So if you were asking me what would I like to see, I would desperately like to see this be injected in the fiscal debate and we resolve it then. But if you miss that, that op opportunity, then you'd have to look at things like you're talking about. Well, please let me thank our, our speaker and join us in the reception.